Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Data Science Institute. Uh, my name is Dr. Desmond Patton. I am the Associate Director for the, for the Data Science Institute in uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Denai Matexa to our Race and Data Science Lecture Series here at the DSI. Uh, Dr. Matexa is an incoming assistant professor of computer and information science at the University of Pennsylvania with a secondary appointment in Penn's Annenberg School for Communications. Dr. Matexa received her PhD in computer science from Stanford University in 2021 and is currently a postdoctoral researcher at Stanford Center for Philanthropy and Civil Society, working on the Program for Democracy and Internet. Previously, Denai received dual undergraduate degrees from Brown University in computer science and science and society. During their academic career, they have had the honor of being recognized by several awards, including the National Science Foundation Graduate Fellowship and an Anita Borg Memorial Scholarship from Google. Their research has been published and awarded at top computer science conference, conference venues, including CHI and CSCW. Without further ado, Dr. Matexa. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Let me start my slides. Wonderful. Uh, hopefully you can see all of those okay. So thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really honored to be joining the seminar series today. I've been super eagerly watching all of the other talks in the series, which have all been super excellent, and I hope I can meet that bar. Uh, I'm a computer scientist by training. I'm currently a postdoc at Stanford, and next year I'll be founding the Human Computer Interaction Group at Penn. And my research focuses on algorithmic content, especially with regards to the experiences of marginalized people and identities with that content. In my work, I use a range of techniques, including computational and behavioral science methods. And today I'm gonna to be talking about using this kind of mixed approach to study representation and belonging in socio-technical systems. So to introduce this work, I first wanna tell you a bit about how I arrived at this topic of study. The computer science department at Brown, where I earned my undergraduate degrees, has this tradition of giving each course a fun theme every year. And this was usually a very popular move with students. There were pop culture topics like television shows or comics. And I really enjoyed most of these things myself, but some of them were like a little bit intense. So maybe this James Bond theme, although for a security class, like maybe that's kind of clever, uh, or this one modeled after Star Trek, or especially this particularly intense Matrix theme. Okay, wait, it gets worse. I hope you can see that animation. It actually ran in the background of the website at all times. So these were all real course websites while I was at Brown. And it's not that I had any particular issue with the Matrix or Star Trek, but as a marginalized person in that environment, it struck me that some of these themes seemed kind of stereotypical of the discipline. And they gave me a sense of intuitive unease. It was one that I knew didn't have anything to do with the actual material of the course, but it was still there. Years later, when I started my PhD, I came across a concept from psychology that helped me give language to that intuition. Ambient belonging is a term that describes the feeling of fitting in with a culture or a community that's passively elicited by the surrounding environment. It's a psychological concept that comes from a broader literature on belongingness. It goes back to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Belongingness describes the psychological need to be accepted as a member of a group. So at the start of my PhD, I found this prior work that had examined ambient belonging in physical spaces like professors' offices. Cherian et al. found that students' sense of belonging can be negatively impacted by classroom cues. Stereotypical cues in offices and classrooms, like what books are on the table or posters are on the wall, these could have a negative effect on potential students, and in particular students from marginalized groups. Now, obviously classrooms and offices are immersive and they reflect personal information about an instructor in a way that web pages aren't and don't. But based on that idea, I decided to design an experiment to see to what extent ambient belonging was transmitted through a user interface and what effects it might have. So I designed two versions of the same course web page for an introductory computer science course at Stanford. The first one used neutral imagery and the second one stereotypical imagery. Both of these were designed and pre-tested to look appealing and engaging to students, and the content on the pages was identical, so I only changed the aesthetic design. My hypothesis was that these should have different effects on potential students. More specifically, that the stereotypical interface would be detrimental to women, but not to men. 
So that would mean hypothetically producing some results figures that looked something like this. So comparing these two interfaces, the neutral one in the darker color, uh, lighter color rather, and the stereotypical one in the darker color, I expected there'd be very little difference in the two bars for men. That's the pair on the left, pretty comparable in height. But that for women, that's the pair on the right, the stereotypical interface would have some negative impact. And on the y-axis here is a seven-point Likert scale for each experimental measure. After interacting with one of the two websites assigned at random, I had participants answer questions on that seven-point Likert scale about a range of measures, whether they would want to take the course, whether they expected they would feel comfortable in it, how well they expected they would do, but also measures that were beyond the scope of the course. So whether they felt confident in their technical abilities overall, whether they even wanted to study computer science, and finally, whether they felt they would be judged according to gender stereotypes in the discipline. And I'll note here that rather than potentially negatively impact a whole cohort of Stanford students enrolling in a real course, I ran this experiment using crowd workers of undergraduate age in the United States. And what I found was really striking. So starting with these course related measures, women exposed to the stereotypical website suffered. As you can see, for each of these measures, the rightmost dark bar that corresponds to women who saw that stereotypical website is statistically significantly lower than all of the others in the figure. So this means they reported lower intention to enroll, less sense of belonging, less anticipated success relative to all other participants. And moreover, women who saw that stereotypical website were also negatively impacted on longer term measures, the ones that ostensibly didn't have to do with this course. So they said they'd be less interested in computer science as a field, less confident in their technical abilities, and they expected to be much more stereotyped in the discipline. And these were moderate to large effect sizes, as large as any in the prior work on ambient belonging in physical spaces. So a wide variety of biases can be conveyed visually and impact belonging. You could consider, for instance, the effect of an image like this one of Paul Ryan's interns when he was Speaker of the House on a young person of color who wants to enter government and doesn't see themselves represented in that image. Or this really grandiose image from the Rhodes Scholarship website and the effect that this could have on a promising student of socioeconomic status uh, that hasn't stepped foot at a place like Oxford and that person's sense of belonging in a community like the Rhodes Scholars. Visual cues in online systems can have unanticipated and unintended consequences on people across a range of different dimensions. That project launched further work from other researchers like Renee Kizilkech at Cornell studying psychologically inclusive design, but it also launched my own research focusing on bias in sociotechnical systems and its psychological effects. So what are sociotechnical systems? Broadly, these are systems that shape and are shaped by users. So they interface directly with people and in turn, they're often shaped by user behaviors. This includes, for instance, search engines and social media sites. And what I want to argue today is that we need to close that loop by studying both the system and the user. If we want to address high stakes social issues in socio-technical systems, we need to do that using mixed methods approaches that combine computational techniques with behavioral science theory and methods. And in my research, I do this by trying to answer two complementary questions. The first is what content do socio-technical systems produce? And the second, how does that content impact users towards building systems that do better? Now, traditionally in a software system, we're used to asking this first question. We know what it means for a system to work. And you know, as computer scientists, we can conduct tests and use monitoring to verify that it does function as expected. But socio-technical systems are in a loop with users. The users are literally part of the system. So it's not enough that the platform just functions. To evaluate these kinds of platforms effectively, we need to ask first what the outputs look like at scale, and second, what impact that has on people. And it's my hope that by answering these two research questions, we can learn how to build socio-technical systems that have more positive impacts on ourselves and on our communities. Now, before I give you a, a roadmap for the rest of this talk, let me explain why this work is so challenging. In the example that we started with, where we compare these two websites, we can see that the content that's created by a single person, like a course instructor, can communicate bias and undermine belonging. But this isn't an individual scale problem. Most socio-technical systems today aren't showing us hand curated content from one person. They provide us with content that's been selected and organized algorithmically. 
And we rely on that algorithmic content for basic social functions like connection to family and friends, gathering information and civic engagement. In the United States, as of 2019, over 70% of Americans used some type of social media and a similar proportion got some of their news through social media. And as of 2012, which is unfortunately the most recent Pew data we have on search engine use, over 90% of online adults use search engines. And that's a number we can only imagine is somehow even higher now. And over two thirds of those searchers considered search engines to be fair and unbiased. But these systems do have significant biases. We've started to see concern about bias on the lines of gender, race, political affiliation, and more. Studying these kinds of systems, going beyond criticism to actually measure the content that they produce and quantify the impact that this has remains a challenge. And I see four key parts to the challenge here, two on the side of the system and two on the side of the user. So first, these systems are dynamic. They change constantly, and this can pose significant technical challenges when we try to study them. Second, the byproducts that they have are ephemeral. So a user's experience of their newsfeed or search engine results disappears without a trace after that interaction, and there's no way to examine it retrospectively. Now, on the side of the user, these systems are embedded. They're in a loop with users. People are interacting with dozens of these kinds of systems simultaneously in a browser on a device throughout their daily lives. And finally, they're personal. Each user's view of some system is unique. And in fact, the impact that it has can be really different from one person to another. So to meet these challenges and close the loop of socio-technical systems research, we really do need interdisciplinary solutions that tackle both sides of that equation. And in this talk, I'm gonna show you what this looks like in practice, touching on three recent projects. So first in the introduction, I described my work on belonging and bias in web interfaces. Next, I'll talk about my most recent paper on race and gender representation in image search. And finally, I'll touch on my most recent ongoing project, building technical infrastructure to study online advertising. So let's move to that second project on race and gender in image search. One social issue that's received attention in various fields is visual representation, in particular, the representation of marginalized people in media. As I showed in that study of course pages, visual cues impact belonging. Um, in the field of advertising, for example, prior work has also shown that representing marginalized people in college brochures can make a university more appealing to students. And the same has been found to be true for employees at a company or for customers of a business. These kinds of cues are really important for marginalized people. They might indicate that some organization could be more welcoming to them. But importantly, the effects of visual representation aren't restricted to those groups alone. Visual diversity signals inclusivity broadly to everyone. So given the importance of algorithmic systems like search and my interest in visual representation, I was drawn to work on image search results. Do image search results accurately reflect real world diversity? Prior work from 2015 had identified that search results for occupations exaggerated gender stereotypes. Since then, and often in response to research findings like that one, Google has made a lot of changes to their algorithms. But are image search results still biased in the way that they present gender? And moreover, the field I'm in has often left race really understudied. Do image search results accurately reflect real world racial diversity? These are the kinds of questions that we just don't have answers to. So to answer these questions, I first needed a ground truth data set with which to compare search results. The US Bureau of Labor Statistics tracks demographic breakdowns of several hundred common US occupations like doctors, lawyers, real estate agents, and whatnot. So based on that BLS list, I set out to collect image search results from Google using as query term the names of those occupations. In my introduction, I described the process of identifying bias in hand design content. But in this case, of course, I wanted to study the composition of hundreds of images for hundreds of queries. And this is where algorithmic content becomes technically challenging to study. So to accomplish this, I built infrastructure to collect that algorithmic data. The pipeline for automatically collecting and processing image search results begins with a scraper to query Google with each of these query terms and capture the resulting top 100 images. To avoid potential personalization from the repeated searches, I used a Selenium web driver with separate sessions per query. And the scraper then saved each image to cloud storage where they were automatically retrieved in the next step for data annotation. 
To annotate the data, I recruited crowd workers through Amazon Mechanical Turk with three people assigned to label each of those 1,000 images. I elected to use crowd workers rather than automated image processing or machine learning because ultimately I'm interested in how other people perceive these images. For gender, crowd workers were asked to label whether the image showed a woman or not, and for race, whether the image depicted a person of color or not. This is obviously a great simplification here. It's a reduction to a single bit. Does this image depict a marginalized person? There are a lot of ways to improve this strategy in the future, but I started with this binary categorization because while both gender and race are spectra, in each case there's a single dominant group that others are marginalized in relation to. And I collected up to three labels, considering this annotation to have reached consensus when two thirds of people agreed. And finally, after eliminating occupations whose image search results didn't show enough people or enough people of discernible race and gender, I settled on a final list of occupations. And I made sure that these occupations weren't statistically significantly different from the full list of all BLS occupations in terms of demographics. So putting all of that together, what does that look like? So beginning with gender, I had this list of occupations with their real world workforce gender diversity from 0% women to 100% on the X axis here. And I could then map each point to a place on the Y axis reflecting the proportion of women in image search results for that occupation. The colors of these data points are arbitrary, but they're just here to help you track each point when they move in a second. And the diagonal line here represents perfect correspondence, where the data points would line up if image search results were perfectly reflective of the real world. So above that line are going to be data points where search results overrepresented women, and below where search results underrepresented women. So let's see some data. For example, we can see here that receptionists are about 88% women, but Google images for receptionists were almost 100% women. Uh, on the other hand, women are 30% of CEOs in the US, but only 11% of search results showed women to be CEOs. And women are actually more than half of all bartenders, but only a quarter of search results for that query. Then doing the same thing for race, we again have a set of occupations with their ground truth workforce demographics. And again, this diagonal dashed line is a perfect accordance between the BLS and Google. So above is overrepresentation compared to the US population, below is underrepresentation. And you'll note here that the axes don't range from zero to one like before, but up to 40%. That's because people of color are 22% of the US workforce on average, so there weren't records of occupations that were above 40% POC. And we can again map that to the demographics observed in search images. And what we see here is that for most occupations, people of color are underrepresented in search. So you could take Chef, for instance. People of color are highly represented in that occupation at 37% but they're still heavily underrepresented in search. Uh, there are some cases, of course, like among librarians where people of color are a small fraction of librarians, but Google overrepresents them in search. Next, to quantify the degree of underrepresentation in both cases, I fit generalized linear models to that data, predicting Google representation from BLS data. And looking at these figures visually, you can see that there's generally an underrepresentation of both women and people of color relative to the workforce even more so in the case of race than of gender. And then to test whether the model's predictions at the overall workforce average, that's the vertical dotted line, was significantly different from proportional, the diagonal line, I examined the model's predictions at that X value and found that indeed these predictions are statistically significantly lower. So summarizing this for digestibility, we could say that for an occupation with 50% women, this model predicts that images will show 42% women. And for an occupation with 22% people of color, the model predicts that images will show 16% people of color. And in both cases, these differences are statistically significant, even more strongly in the case of race than of gender. So going back to this first question, do search results reflect real world diversity? In this data set, we find that no, images systematically underrepresent women and people of color relative to workforce participation rates. The process that I used to answer this first research question is called an algorithm audit. If you've been following this talk series, you'll have heard more about algorithm audits a few weeks ago from Deb Raji, uh, and that talk was really excellent. So um, for those of you who haven't seen it, let me just give a short recap here. Algorithm audits are the process of providing repeated inputs and measuring outputs of an opaque system to draw inferences about its inner workings. 
auditing without the algorithm part is a really powerful tool that's been used in the social sciences for decades to identify discrimination in employers hiring practices or loaners lending practices, for example. And in the context of algorithms, we adapt it to examine whether an algorithm displays bias. And without going into it too extensively, um, I want to make a note here on algorithm auditing. As you've seen from that one example, conducting effective algorithm audits is technically challenging, like deciding what to measure, how do we collect that data, how do we manage it at scale, and at times it can be theoretically and ethically challenging as well, so it usually involves breaking a platform's terms of service, which historically was illegal. So recently I've been working with a team of algorithm audit researchers from four universities and we've written what we hope is going to be a really comprehensive piece on algorithm auditing, including its history, best practices, ethics, and norms. So if you're interested in learning more about algorithm auditing, you can keep an eye out for that. I think it's going to be published in the next month or so. We're almost done. Um, or also listen to Deb's excellent talk from a few weeks ago in this talk series. So back to our project. Having answered that first research question using an algorithm audit, I also wanted to close the loop by connecting a second study that answers that second question. How does biased content impact users and how can we do better? So first I selected a set of 10 occupations, five for race and five for gender, in which marginalized people are heavily underrepresented. I chose these because I felt they were among the most high impact examples since women and people of color might already feel that they don't belong in those occupations. Next, I created synthetic image search results pages uh, using the actual images collected in the earlier algorithm audit study. So for each of these 10 occupations, I created three synthetic search results pages one with images predominantly from the dominant group, one with images predominantly from the marginalized group, and another with equal representation. And I designed a randomized controlled study for each occupation, exposing participants in the studies to one of the three conditions at random. After that exposure, I then asked each participant questions about three measures of interest on a seven-point Likert scale. So first, about their perception of how inclusive that occupation is, Second, their interest in joining the occupation. And third, whether they felt they would belong or be valued in it. So what did we find? First, let me explain how to read these kinds of figures I'm about to show you. So the first dimension I varied is gender, and that's shown here along the x-axis. So we can see how participants' perceptions of occupation inclusivity changed as the proportion of women in those synthetic search results was increased. Second, each of those search results also had some distribution of racial representation. And that's shown here with three different lines showing participant responses on the outcome measure as the proportion of people of color was increased. So reading this figure together, what can we conclude? We find that greater representation of marginalized groups makes occupations seem more inclusive across the board. So reading all three lines from left to right across the figure, we can see that participants' expectations of inclusivity generally increase the more women they were shown. Next, examining the three lines separately, we find that showing search results with greater representation of people of color also had a positive impact on inclusivity. In particular, showing medium or high levels of POC representation had a positive effect on the perceived inclusivity relative to low levels of racial representation. And we validate these findings statistically. So fitting a linear model to this data that predicts perceived inclusivity from these two features both race and gender representation in images had a positive and statistically significant impact on expectations of inclusivity. And you'll note that that's consistent with the prior literature on visual diversity making organizations seem more inclusive. Next, let's examine results in the same format for the second measure, participants reported interest in an occupation. Here we see somewhat different results. So while increasing racial representation did slightly increase interest in the field, as you can see from those stacked lines, increasing gender representation actually had a borderline negative effect on people's interest in the field. And again, fitting a model to predict interest from gender and race representation in the stimuli, we can confirm that finding. So in this case, we actually found that search results with more women had a negative effect, if anything, on our outcome measure. We might want to think about what could explain this. One possible explanation is occupational feminization. That's a series of theories in social science that describe the cultural turn that happens as women become more represented in some occupation. And the closely related idea that pay and other status markers decrease as women's representation increases. 
So although we might have reason to believe that increasing women's representation in image search results is a normatively good idea, in some cases it can empirically lead to counterintuitive or even counterproductive outcomes. Now going back to this setup, there's one piece missing here. In addition to exposing participants to different conditions and collecting their responses, I also collected demographic characteristics like race and gender for each participant. While the previous two results I showed were largely consistent across people, on issues like belonging, I expected that people from marginalized groups might be affected in significantly different ways than those who aren't. So next I'm gonna show you two more findings about participant sense of belonging, specifically examining differences by participants' gender and then by participants' race in addition to the stimuli. So first let's examine sense of belonging as women's representation was increased, separating participants by gender. As you can really clearly see here, women's representation in images had a significant effect on participant sense of belonging, but that effect was heavily moderated by participant gender. So when shown search results with really low representation of women, men were much more likely than women to say they felt belonging. But as I increased the proportion of women in those search results, women's belonging increased while men's decreased to the point where they almost converged. So here we find that women's sense of belonging improves with greater representation while men's declines. What this means is that we can actually compensate for pre-existing differences in gendered perceptions of belonging by increasing visual representation of women. But what it also means is that increasing women's sense of belonging might happen at some small but noticeable cost to men's sense of belonging. And again, fitting a linear model to this data, we see that gender in search results and participant gender both had a significant effect on sense of belonging, as did the interaction of these two. Finally, I did the same analysis for race, separating participants by whether they identified as white or people of color, and examining the effect of increasing racial representation in image search. Unlike the case of gender, though, I didn't observe a significant effect of image diversity on participant sense of belonging. Racial gaps in belonging were unchanged by visual representation. Across the board, white participants reported a higher sense of belonging than people of color, and no amount of racial representation in those search results could change that. And again, we confirm this finding statistically. So to conclude, these kinds of findings confirm that visual representation in algorithmic content can change people's expectations of the world and their place in it. But as we saw, there are some important nuances here. So first, more isn't always better. Greater levels of marginalized people's representation can in some cases have deterring effects, perhaps because of underlying social issues. Second, identity moderates effects. The same content might affect people from different identity groups very differently. And third, there are some cases where existing inequity simply can't be addressed at all through some intervention. Technical fixes won't suffice for big social problems. So the common thread you'll see here is that even though we're addressing some of these issues or studying them through a technical lens, there are underlying social issues here that are the real important thing to focus on. And as I said earlier, there are these four key challenges to studying socio-technical systems. They're dynamic, ephemeral, embedded, and personalized. And research like mine closes that loop, connecting the socio and technical parts of those systems using a combination of computational and behavioral science strategies. But as we've seen, the overhead to doing this work is really significant. So for each website we wanna study, we need to build new custom infrastructure, and that infrastructure only generally allows us to study one website at a time. And in order to control the stimuli that users see, we have to run experiments in highly controlled artificial experimental settings. So in order to enable more researchers to do this work and to do it more sustainably, in addition to doing things like create guidelines and best practices, we also will need more effective tools. While there are some existing tools for this kind of research, they have really significant limitations. There are many examples of one-off infrastructure for passive audits, as I showed you in the last project, and these can be really valuable, but they generally only collect data from one website at a time, new infrastructure has to be built for each new audit, and any experiments or interventions need to be run separately. Another option is panel survey data that's collected by private companies. This kind of data can be reanalyzed by researchers who don't have to collect it all from scratch, but in such logs, we can only see what websites users visited. So not images, headlines, or other kinds of content that people consume without visiting a new URL. And the data sources also don't allow for experiments and can be really expensive to get access to. 
And finally, I think some of the most promising work has been proposed by Mozilla, who are developing a tool to let researchers collect data and run experiments in the browsers of volunteers. This gives a lot of researcher control and allows for intervention, which is great. But using volunteers limits data collection and intervention to things that Mozilla will approve and the users will tolerate on a volunteer basis. Plus, researchers can't follow up with participants through surveys or other kinds of data collection. So going back to these challenges, ideally what we want is to allow researchers to collect data themselves in real time. To do that for extended periods of time, perhaps following up with the same users later. To choose exactly what data to collect from browsing across all websites. And to combine this kind of auditing with interventions on consenting participants. And that's Intervenor. So Intervenor is a system I'm building that's designed to allow researchers to both passively audit and also intervene on the cross-site browsing experience of a group of consenting, compensated participants. This is going to be the last project I touch on today, and it's a system that's built for conducting auditing and interventions specifically applied in the domain of online advertising. The system itself has three parts. The first is a front end, a Django web app that users interact with to sign up as paid participants. The second is a Chrome browser extension that participants install in their browsers and which can then collect things like the trail of links that participants visit online, along with timestamps and also content on the page customizable by the researcher. So this could include images, headlines, links, or other content that participants are viewing online. And third is the back end that combines and securely stores these two data sources where researchers can access them later for analysis. So with this system in place, we can meet and even surpass the current state of the art in auditing. The system allows researchers to recruit paid participants, collect observational data about their browsing habits or content exposure, develop interventions like hiding or altering certain content, and then measure the impact of that adjustment. And we can use this intervention to study a wide range of topics. So for instance, we've just run a pilot study using Intervenor to study how people access and consume news media. But the work I want to close by touching on today is in the domain of online advertising. We've probably all noticed or heard at this point that marketing and branding is often heavily gendered and related concepts like whitewashing describe the way that dominant norms like what's considered attractive, professional or marketable are also racialized and affect the way that we see race presented in media like movies and ads. And moreover, the content that we see in ads should have some psychological impact. That's kind of the whole point of advertising. So given that backdrop and the harms that I've shown you can occur from biases in gender and racial representation in algorithmic content, I'm interested in whether online ads also display these kinds of biases. Existing work has found that from the perspective of an advertiser, online advertising platforms really don't have sufficient safeguards in place to prevent advertisers from doing things like racially targeting ads for housing and employment, even though it's illegal to do so. And similarly, that ads for things like STEM careers might not be shown equally to men and women. But if we wanted to study the set of all ads actual users are shown, current algorithm auditing techniques fall short. So they usually collect data from a single website, and that data is kind of a presumed stand-in for what all people are seeing. But in this case, ads are shown to people across many websites, the whole web, and they're highly personalized. So in this domain, we'll use Intervenor to answer three types of questions. First, about exposure. Intervenor can collect all of the ads that people see in the browser and get a full picture of the content of those ads. So we can look at things like the distribution of gender and skin tone and ask whether they're representative of diversity. Second, Intervenor will deploy to a group of real users, collecting the ads that they're shown across all the websites they visit, and then allow us to study the repeated exposures of those ads in the context of those users' own demographics to understand, for instance, whether people of different races or genders are shown significantly different ads or whether they're affected by ads differently. And finally, we can also experimentally change the ads that people see to causally demonstrate the effect that these kind of ads can have on people's perceptions of that technology and of themselves. But to situate and contextualize that more computational part of the project, I'm also beginning with a first study doing interviews about people uh, with people about their experiences with online advertising. So to that end, last summer we conducted 18 interviews with people about their experiences with online ads, in particular recruiting from the LGBTQ community for our interviews. The reason for this focus on queer users is twofold. First, as we've seen throughout this talk, marginalized users are a sort of edge case 
they often weren't the system designers expected users. And so they show us the limitations in the ways that socio-technical systems are constructed, like the broad strokes assumptions they rely on that don't hold for everyone. And second, of course, is that we need to specifically attend to marginalized people and ensure that their experiences of a system are as good as everyone else's before we could consider that system to be functional or adequate. So next, I want to give you a sense of a few preliminary findings from that interview study. Um, first, a little information about our interviewees. We interviewed 18 people who identified as LGBTQ ages 19 to 41. Our participants were 55% POC and 45% white and 59% identified as trans or non-binary and 41% as cisgender. In the interviews themselves, here are a few key themes we saw emerge. So first, we heard that people are experiencing targeting in their online ads across a really wide range of dimensions, including race, gender, sexuality, religion, interests, and more. Second, uh, specifically regarding the content they're being advertised tailored to their queer identities, Many of our participants voiced that it came across as insincere, performative, tokenizing, or like pinkwashing. So we heard from participant seven, I think I would want all aspects of my identity represented, but the problem is like if it's done insincerely, like a lot of content that features trans people, you can tell it's not a very sincere attempt. It just seems like jumping on the bandwagon. And when it actually comes down to supporting trans rights, they're not there. And importantly, we heard that marginality compounds intersectionally. So our least marginalized participants were most likely to say that the ads they were seeing represented them adequately. Whereas those who held multiple marginalized identities like people of color, trans participants for a couple of examples, they found that content especially problematic and harmful. So to quote participant 18, it's not the problem that like one advertiser uses a gay man with washboard abs to sell their product. It's a problem that that's the only way they are. And from participant 12, a lot of advertisements kind of overlook, for me personally, disability or chronic illness. It can be hard to see ads that don't represent your friend group. Of course, this is a super abbreviated summary of our findings. Um, there's a lot more here. So if you're interested in hearing the full length paper, stay tuned for that sometime next year. And finally, in addition to writing up that first study right now, we're also finalizing the infrastructure we need for our second study to collect the ad images shown to people while browsing. And next, we'll be recruiting participants to use that tool, allowing us to get a lens into the experiences of a wider group of people with online ads. So to conclude, in this talk, we've touched on three projects that I think exemplify this approach to studying representation and belonging in socio-technical systems. First, showing that psychologically inclusive design can impact people's sense of belonging in the context of a course. Second, that racial and gender biases do appear in algorithmic content and can have detrimental effects on people in the context of employment. And that different levels of representation can cause positive and negative psychological responses. And third, in this current work towards understanding these kinds of biases and their impacts on marginalized people in online advertising. Socio-technical systems and the content that they produce are going to continue growing as one of our main sources of education, professional opportunities, civic engagement, and more. So the takeaway that I have, especially for a data science audience, is that it's really vital that our work considers both sides of that equation, the system and the people using it, and that we do this keeping in mind and in focus the experiences specifically of marginalized users. By closing that loop between alg algorithmic content and its effects on people, we can build socio-technical systems that have positive impacts on ourselves and on our communities. Thank you again so much for your time and attention, and I'm really happy now to take questions. Thank you so much. I am impressed, wowed, and I've taken so many notes. So thank you so much. This has been wonderful. You made me think a lot about um, some of the challenges that we have with recruitment um, for underrepresented groups in data science. And we have turned over the table to think about so many different considerations, but we have never had a, had a conversation around representation visually on our platforms that may um, influence that decision-making process. So this has been um, illuminating. We have a number of questions in the chat, but I wanted to open up with a non-technical question. Um, I am co-teaching a design justice course with engineering faculty, and that course is um, informed by Sasha Castaneda Shok's book. 
And I'm very curious about, so one of the things we talk about um, in that class are values and principles that guide our design choices. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your, your values and principles that have guided the questions that you're pursuing. And if there have been times when th those values have been in conflict with the tools that you're using to answer those questions. Yeah, this is an excellent question and one that I will struggle to distill into a short amount of time because I think about it a lot. Um, yeah, uh, so the values that I have that I try to turn into sort of a main thesis in my work to make sure that I'm like aligning myself in the right direction are especially regarding uh, the experiences that marginalized people have with technology. So, you know, I have this expertise in sort of computational work and in studying technology. And for me, it's really important that that be grounded in the lived experiences of people with marginalized identities specifically. So as a non-binary queer person, as a child of immigrants, these are things that I have been thinking about for a long time. And obviously, uh, at times in my career, I've looked around the room and noticed that like there were not necessarily many people around me who were sort of oriented in that direction. Um, there are myriad examples and uh, situations that I'm in where that's a hard line to walk, because as all of us know who are trying to function within some uh, problematic system, and that includes, you know, tech industry, it includes the academy, it, it includes like the United States, uh, it's going to be the case that the organizations and the situations that we're in are not necessarily set up to allow someone like us to thrive. And so I don't really believe in making compromises on my values. And I would rather kind of uh, excuse myself from those spaces where I feel like I can't authentically show up and be myself. Um, but I do know that there are a lot of places that are sort of a gray area where I have to try to balance, like what's the good that I think I can do in some environment or some context versus, you know, how much do I think it's going to sort of like corrupt the, the fundamental message that I'm trying to bring. I don't know if that's a very satisfying answer, but it is something that I think about a lot. No, that's very helpful. Thank you for, for uh, sharing. Uh, I want to jump into the, the Q&A. Um, so opinion question, do you think the advancement application of reinforcement learning algorithms will will create greater bias over time? Well, um, this question asks for a comparison about whether it's greater bias or not. Uh, and that's hard for me to evaluate. I think it's probably circumstantial. I definitely think that there is the potential for reinforcement learning and other kinds of machine learning or artificial intelligence to be perpetuating biases that already exist and either to be exaggerating them or at least not to be fixing them. Um, so yes, I think that's a real risk and that's why I think it's especially important that we not just be um, building systems that use those kinds of tools without really deeply understanding what effect that's going to have on actual people. Awesome. Good answer. Um, I'm wondering about the baseline. You are measuring bias against BLS statistics, but Google search is also reflecting prestige depending on the case. So for example, if you up, if you up uh, chefs, you see a lot of prestige chefs who tend to be old and white, says Paul Bocuse. On CEOs, they're they are mostly generic images, so I don't see a prestige bias. Have you worked on this possibility? Yeah, this is a great question. I was finding that for most of these searches, Google is kind of providing some generic set of almost like stock images. And there weren't too many differences, although perhaps in the case of something like chefs, where there are a lot of like big name people who are tightly associated with that term, that could be sort of a driving factor. Um, so I haven't specifically looked into this, but absolutely it's it's uh, things like prestige, but also like popularity. Um, those are gonna be driving search results to some extent. And also regarding the sort of choice of a baseline, I think it's useful to have a baseline to anchor against to kind of uh, give us a set of expectations, but it's not that I think that the BLS list is somehow a gold standard, you know, that if we are uh, in our tools online reflecting the very biased and problematic nature of American society, that somehow this means that we've like fixed the problem. Uh, I think it's mostly just useful there as an anchor to sort of compare against. Absolutely. Uh, next question. Uh, this is a great presentation. Thanks a lot for your great work. You sound not too optimistic regarding undoing racial disparities. Could you please explain your findings on a racial dis on a racial disparities and explain why it feels hard to change? Yeah, um, without 
doing more follow-ups, which I haven't yet on that particular finding, I can't give you sort of like a set of a hundred percent solid reasons for why that is. But we can imagine that given the state of inequality in America, uh, that first of all, there's going to be a really wide range of experiences that different people of color have. It's certainly not a monolith. Again, it's like a useful category grouping to put in opposition to the more dominant group. But I think there's going to be a lot more variance within that category. And so maybe in some cases, there are some kinds of representation that could improve people's sense of belonging. But in other cases, I think it would be naive to think that if we just change the kind of content people are seeing online, that they're not going to also be deriving their expectations from their lived experience in the world. Um, so, you know, I, I guess that's sort of the fundamental answer that people are existing, um, not just uh, online, but also offline. And that's, that's really right. going to inform how they approach these kinds of systems and inform how they interpret the content that they're shown. Absolutely. Uh, lots of uh, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'd like to ask if they are working in uh, stereotypes in digital news, some commentary about Facebook's aesthetics and style. Oh, this is a really cool question. Um, <laughs> thank you, Francisco. Uh, one direction that I have followed that idea has been a, not Facebook specifically, but almost Facebook. I've studied uh, Instagram. And so I have with some great collaborators from UC Berkeley, some work that we did a couple of years ago studying Finstas, which are these like secondary accounts that people make sort of you have your primary Instagram, which sometimes gets called a Rinsta, it's a portmanteau of real Instagram. Mm -hmm. And then people have secondary accounts that they call Finstas. And we were specifically interested in how people, like who is doing this practice? How are they using these different types of accounts differently? And a lot of it comes down to things like aesthetic and style. So we're finding that these are really popular, especially among young women who socially are under a lot of pressure to be presenting themselves in some particular aesthetic and sort of um, presentable way. They find a lot of peer pressure from their, from their peers, of course, from their families to be uh, presenting a particular version of themselves online in addition to in real life. And so they have these Finsta accounts as a way of putting up images that are not touched up, that aren't posed, that are kind of messy, that are maybe funny or humorous, and sort of break out of that image that they're trying to convey in the rest of their life. And so it seems really important, especially for this population, to have an outlet where they're able to perform a more authentic and sort of less uh, rehearsed, less practiced version of themselves. Um, so that is one uh, direction in which I've, I've been thinking about aesthetics and style and, and how that's reflected online. So one of the, you uh, leverage um, algorithmic auditing as a potential intervention in this space. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the translation of your work for folks who are non-technical, but still may work in tech spaces or for the everyday citizen. So for example, um, Courtney Cogburn and I are training social workers to work in tech spaces. I'm trying to think about the role that they could also play um, to intervene in these types of um, uh, missteps. Do you have any thoughts around what, what uh, other types of folks can do in this space? Yeah, definitely. So um, in this piece we have coming out next month on algorithm auditing, uh, a big part of the audience of that is uh, journalists and other people who are interested in um, either conducting or evaluating algorithm audits and kind of understanding if they are of what kind of quality, like sort of how much do these findings hold, how much do they generalize and that sort of thing. So I think that there's a lot of sort of understanding this method that can help a more general audience know how to evaluate these kinds of technical artifacts. And also I should say there's a lot of great work that's just starting to happen now around sort of extending citizen science into the domain of auditing. So thinking about collaborative audits or crowdsourced audits and providing opportunities for um, people with a really wide range of expertise to be contributing to those kinds of efforts. So that's sort of one direction I think that algorithm auditing is is going in that's more um, inclusive and, and sort of like uh, allows space for a really wide range of types of people to join. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much uh, for your time. Is, is there a way for our audience to reach you or be able to connect with you on your work? Yeah, please. I had my email up at the very end of that slide, but let me also just drop it in the chat here. 
Um, it is my last name at cs.stanford.edu. So um, please do feel free to send me an email. Also, hi, Vera. I noticed a comment in the chat that we met in 2015. So that's a lovely surprise to see you here. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And, and also thank you to Shervin who drops a note on uh, tailoring and ads. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Have a great day. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much, Desmond. Goodbye.